Um, and as I said, um, particular importance, um, making sure that the farmers that are talking to you understand the farming relationship. So um, we can have the, the context of a farm owner operating through a farm management company um, who then engages a share milker or a contract milker. Um, just want to be really clear that a lot of um, people that engage those management companies, they um, believe that the health and safety obligation is then with the, a farm management company, but clearly that is actually two separate PCBUs with two sets of responsibilities. Um, a lot of the farms that I've been to, and this again comes to the lack of understanding um, of the relationships, um, farm owners who say it's the share milkers um, responsibility to have a health and safety plan or it's the share milkers um, responsibility to run the health and safety or they share a health and safety plan. They're two separate PCBUs so they need to have two separate um, health and safety policies and you want to be very clear that as a farm owner um, you don't want to be taking the responsibility of, of training the staff um, so you would be wanting to say in your policy things like the share milker um, must ensure the staff are trained um, and the share milker will supply us training records in our annual review. So, so just clarify that, you want two separate policies? They're two yeah. separate um, entities. Yeah. So um, I can, I've got a piece of case law here that I'll discuss with you as well, um, which will help make this clear. So as a farm owner of, of the dairy farm, I don't personally employ the staff, so therefore I can't have a drug and alcohol policy um, with those employees. But what I can do as part of my share milking arrangements, I can state that the share milker um, must have a drug and alcohol policy because that would be a practicable step as the owner of that farm. Mm. Um, and in the event of an accident, um, personally, um, now that we're off our farm and we had an equity you know, partnership arrangement with someone else taking care of day-to-day -day things on the farm, I wouldn't be willing to go you know, share a health and safety plan. I would want myself protected as a director and as a farm owner. So the two separate, say one accident occurs, the share milkers employee rolls, rolls the quad bike and um, they haven't met their requirements as an employer. I'm not really willing to be paying out 600,000 or going to jail. So it's very important that you understand that there's two health and safety plans and that's where this generic thing comes up again because if it's generic, how can it actually meet the requirements of a farm owner with a share milker or a farm owner with a contract milker? So, so in that situation, can you clearly um, stipulate the responsibility of each within a, a shared document or are you saying you have to have two separate documents? I definitely wouldn't take the risk of having a shared document. I would have uh, responsibility written there. Absolutely. Right. Um, I'd be protecting um, protecting my entity by saying, you know, the share milker mm -hmm. and, and, and providing that supporting documentation, um, you know, to help the share milker achieve. They definitely need to communicate the two health and safety mm -hmm. plans. Can I give you an example? Mm -hmm. um, I've got a client that's prosecuted in South and Based operating in Dunedin, putting in place a bridge across the harbour for rail. They engaged a specialist piling outfit to pile the piles <laughs> for the um, bridge and the piling machine fell off the bridge that they were making and into the harbour. And my client is likened them to the farm owner and, and, and the piling operator was effectively the <coughs> My client who was the main farm owner was prosecuted for the injury that occurred to the pile driver, <coughs> driver man. And they successfully defended it because of course they had a whole separate different set of health and safety obligations than what the pile driving company did. And because they were able to say, well look, we've taken all practical steps so far as our relationship is concerned, as let's call it farm owner, then the prosecution must sit with the pile driving company because they're the ones that mucked it up that meant that they fell over because they weren't following their health and safety policies that we'd asked to see had, had vetted and, and secured, but they didn't follow their own processes. So the, the prosecution successfully sat <coughs> with the pile driver, not my client, the bridge builder. And it's the same scenario. So as a farm owner, you want to be absolutely comfortable that all your risks are mitigated, but there are a different set of risks for the share who's employing the staff and actually doing the milk harvesting, if we can call it that.
So I'll um, give you a shea milk of farm owner example just to ensure that we really understand this. So um, this is an actual case that's um, already occurred in New Zealand with a Mankino shea milker. Um, now they had an excellent health and safety history, they had sound health and safety processes in place. The farm owner in their health and safety um, documentation had stipulated that it was the shea milker's responsibility um, to ensure the training of the staff. Um, they had gone as far as to say that the shea milker must identify um, the paddocks that weren't suitable for quad bikes. The shea milker provided the quad bikes and was expected to maintain them. Um, the employee um, went sideways across um, quite a steep paddock and rolled and WorkSafe came in and investigated um, that particular accident and requested the health and safety plan off the farm owner who was able to supply it and requested the health and safety plan off the shear milker. Now, um, where the shear milker um, failed to meet um, all practicable steps was they hadn't highlighted specific no-go zones um, on the farm for the quad bikes. And that was the one area where they had gone wrong and they considered it a practicable step to have highlighted that that was a, a paddock that shouldn't have had quad bikes in it due to the steep gradients. But that cost that shear milker around 100,000 um, in total. Um, like the same thing happens with fur truck drivers. My parents have got one with the zones coloured in where they're not allowed to go. Um, but what happens if they do go in there and they do roll it? Um, that is that. This is a great example. Um, so that's a, a contractor that has been contracted to spread fur on a farm, and the farmer has got a map with specific um, paddocks um, <coughs> coloured in to say you don't take the fur truck there. Mm -hmm. um, so. That um, map um, with the hazard should be sent to the contracting company, to the owner of that company. That um, owner of that company should sign that off to say, yes, I've cited this map, yes, I understand the hazards that apply to this farm. I'll ensure that whoever I send to the farm is aware of these no-go zone paddocks. Um, so I will train my employees. And then um, if there was an accident, obviously the farmer has taken all practicable steps to ensure that, that no one goes into those paddocks. Um, a, quite a common thing that is popping up on a lot of farms, um, particularly dairy farms down south, is small signs about this big um, that have got no-go zones if it's a quad bike no-go zone um, and a small one for no-go zones on the fence post. So um, if you have moments of being a bit blonde um, and a map's difficult to read, at least when you got to the paddock and we're entering there's something to remind you that um, that's not a, a suitable paddock. Uh, just another question on when you're employing a shear milker. Um, when you're shear milker employing uh, employees, you can do a capability or skill based training. Uh, when you're a farm owner who is contracting a shear milker, is it advisable to ask for proof of skill level uh, by the contractual process? Because it's a lot harder to implement the training process for somebody who's contracted. That's How would you? That's correct. So ensuring that your um, contractors are trained, which is no different than when we hire the bulky truck yeah. um, drivers. So if you were going to um, hire a nanny for your children, okay, you're going to be checking out that they have got credentials or they've got good references. And when we engage a contractor in our business, um, we should be looking that they have got a good safety record, requesting their health and safety plan, um, seeing what their... So if you were hiring a shear milker effectively, asking them um, for their training records themselves of what industry training they'd completed, mm -hmm. um, looking at their health and safety plan. And if a shear milker arrived with a generic off the shelf or no health and safety plan, probably you know something worth a further discussion with them about how he would intend on meeting those obligations. Is there any responsibilities around the health and wellbeing? Yes, very much so. Um, so around um, workplace disease, six to 900 New Zealanders um, die from workplace illness every year. So um, it's quite a, a large um, issue for the country. Um, so yes, if, when we talk about health and safety, and this is probably one where a lot of farmers have a misconception as well, when they think of health and safety, they think of physical harm, tipping off the quad bike, um, you know, crashing the tractor. Um, it actually does definitely apply to health and wellbeing. So, um, that is likes of lepto. There's still actually cases of lepto being reported through to WorkSafe every year. Um, and as I said about the hearing, um, and you know the decibels um, being too high, particularly in milking sheds, um, so hearing's an issue. And then we've got responsibility for working in the sun, ensuring we 
provide sunscreen and um, give a good sun message, sun smart message. So um, it definitely includes um, wellbeing in your health and safety management plan and that's probably I, something I see lacking a lot in the generic plans. Fatigue as well. Fatigue is a huge one. Um, so with fatigue, um, just to cover that, there's actually an industry guideline around fatigue. Um, so quite a few people um, think that there's you know, set days or set hours, etc. Um, there is an industry specific guideline for farming um, and basically it doesn't put a limit on you can only work nine hours a day. What it says is about drinking um, half a litre of water per hour, a litre per hour when it's a hot day. They give you um, practical things that you should be Im implementing. And that's what Janet's probably alluding to with um, when she was explaining about the questioning of staff and really understanding your health and safety management systems when they interview employees. So if someone's had an accident and they think a contributing factor is fatigue and they interview the other employees and say, okay, what do you guys do around avoiding um, fatigue? And the employees go, oh, we get two days off every 12 days. Um, you know, and that's their response and they're not um, lining up with what the policy says, then you would definitely know that the employees probably hadn't been trained. So fatigue is a huge one, huge contributing factor, particularly with tractor accidents. Um, so the key components um, at management level of health and safety, and Janet um, went over this. I'm just going to quickly um, whip through this part and then I'll talk about what that looks like. So hazard management. Um, it is a requirement to identify every specific hazard on the farm um, and then we have to take that a step further and ensure that we've identified the significant hazards. We need to have specific controls in place for each one of those hazards and we need to have an accident incident near miss um, reporting recording process. Most of the farms that I've visited have had serious harm accidents on their farm but they haven't understood what serious harm was so they haven't reported it through to WorkSafe. Um, I would estimate that I've visited 160 odd farms in, for health and safety in the last two years um, and I would be willing to bet my right hand that um, all of those farms have told me stories of serious harm accidents that have occurred that they haven't reported and not because they were trying to evade prosecution um, but they genuinely did not understand what a serious harm accident was. Yeah, sure. Um, so most farmers have had quad bike rollovers on their farm where they've had a broken bone and they wouldn't consider a broken bone as a serious harm accident. Um, amputations of a minor nature, like having tips of fingers cut off. Um, but yeah, largely broken bones and minor um, amputations. Um, head injuries, getting knocked out, um, and, like on the quad bike and um, having to seek specialist um, attention from a neurologist for six weeks. That's one I can think of. They were like, oh, that can't be serious harm. I was back at work after seven weeks. So, um, yeah, and obviously currently um, serious harm is very prescriptive. Um, so it lists off what, what specifically serious harm is. Um, but going forward with the proposed act, um, it's actually more broad and it looks at sort of three levels of harm. So that will be changing um, with the proposed act. But currently it is very specific. So actually having that listed... Um, in the health and safety plan and ensuring people are trained to understand what serious harm is is really important because um, there is penalties for failure to report so, and they put you in the same category as um, the categories that Janet went through. So failing to report a serious harm accident um, does carry um, quite some significant weight and you might be thinking how would they find out that you didn't um, <coughs> report it? So in the case that we're currently dealing with, um, with this fatality with the quad bike, um, my second day on the farm, um, when I was carrying out the investigation, um, I said to them, have you had um, previous um, incidents on the farm? And they talked about different accidents that had happened um, earlier years. And that's obviously how you know, those things can come out. Um, you know, they just were unaware of, and he was a farmer, since, his parents had farmed it since 1925. So you can imagine that, that generation of um, things that had occurred over the years with um, bulky drivers on the farm and, and different employees. So it is very common to go to farms and um, particularly broken bones I'd say is probably the most common that's not reported. Um, so making sure there's um, emergency procedures in place and again there's lots of generic 
options of these um, in these plans, but they aren't actually um, what they would want their employees to do in an um, emergency situation. The number of farms I visit where the farm workers couldn't actually tell me the rapid number to get emergency services to the farm is concerning and delays time. Um, staff training and supervision, as I said, actually having um, recorded documents to show that your staff um, are trained and capable of using vehicles and machinery. Most farmers are actually really good at um, training someone before they let them use the tractor um, or the quad bike, but they don't have um, records or, or have a process for capturing that. Um, employee engagement, as I said, um, I haven't. I feel a bit sad sometimes when um, farmers get bagged in the media about their um, health and safety. <coughs> I haven't met a farmer yet, um, and this is genuine, that when I've actually um, spent the time training and implementing a health and safety management system that hasn't got on board with it, I personally think it's a, a lack of education um, in terms of what the requirements are and the whys. Um, the resistance for helmets, um, you know, my husband decided that he'd just use the ute after I told him he had to wear a helmet. That was his solution. And two months um, into the, the process of everyone wearing a helmet, um, he would often walk into the cow shed still with his helmet on because he'd forgotten it was there. And that's sort of the same common things that I see with a lot of the farms where we've implemented health and safety. A lot of farmers wouldn't let their children operate a bike without a helmet, but yet they seem to think their brains don't need to be <laughs> protected. Um, the general reasons they give me for not wanting to wear helmets is that water runs down the back of their neck when it's raining. Um, so there's particular brands of helmets that have um, actual attached flaps over the back to stop the water running down your neck, because I didn't particularly enjoy that either. Um, and not being able to wear a beanie um, on a cold day and getting ice cream headache is another common complaint. But again, um, if you purchased um, what they call an elite helmet, it's a particular brand available at lots of um, bike shops, but also Federated Farmers um, Farm Safe website has them, and they're adjustable. So you can fit big heads um, or multiple layers of beanies um, with those um, helmets. So it's about um, making sure that we engage with our employees and understand if the equipment isn't um, safe. We do have one big head here. No. <laughs> we actually had to get a, a very large motorcycle helmet. It was the only way. Oh, that's a, that must have been a huge head. <laughs> it was. <laughs> um, yes, do you have any uh, experience with things like uh, turbans and, and helmets and turbans? Is there any um, never, per, never personally um, come across um, an employee not being able to wear um, a helmet because of a turban, um, but I'd imagine that I would be, um, if that was the case, I'd be supplying him, if he was a valued employee, I'd be wanting to supply him an appropriate vehicle where he didn't need to wear the helmet. Yeah. It wouldn't be a, a good, it wouldn't be a good enough reason, you know, not to um, wear a helmet. But um, again, if I was looking up, you know, it might be that I supply them a ute. There's one side-by-side um, -side vehicle available in which you just have to wear a seatbelt, but most of those side-by-side -side vehicles you do have to wear helmets, but there is one on the market that you don't, so that might have been an alternative. Yeah. Um, good question. Melissa, haven't had that one before. Yes? Melissa, do you want to comment on the expiry date for helmets? Because there's also a presumption that once I buy a helmet, the helmet is uh, useful for five or ten years, which is... Yes, um, very important, yeah, very important point about helmets. Um, <laughs> some of the um, ag hats um, that I've seen on farms, um, they look in perfect order. Um, that's because they've generally been hanging in the shed for maybe five or six years. Uh, but yeah, it's very important inside the helmet there is an expiry date for that helmet, um, and they should be replaced. Um, different brands have different um, durations, but one key point um, that a lot of farms aren't aware of is if the helmets have um, been involved in an incident, they also should be checked and replaced if required. Um, just like a cycle helmet, it might still look in perfect order, but it could have altered um, the protection on the inside. Um, so it's, there's been a lot. Uh, there was a number of companies that were offering to do take your helmets in and have them checked for free. Um, and that it was amazing the amount of farmers that were using um, helmets that had expired or they'd been previously dropped on the concrete or involved in small collisions. Covering how we would look after contract, um, contractors and visitors, 
um, Janet touched on, obviously with the new um, definitions um, in the Act, these people um, will be workers in a workplace and we'll cover off how to deal with those um, in a few seconds. Um, I briefly touched on before vehicle equipment and machinery maintenance, ensuring that we've actually got good accurate um, records of the uh, maintenance that we carry out, so whether it's a weekly checklist for quad bikes or tractors, um, ensuring that all employees know how to carry out a five point check before they operate a quad bike. Um, and making sure that we've got specific policies covering things like bullying and harassment and drug and alcohol, as Janet already um, has covered. And um, most importantly, in our hazard management register, ensuring that we do refer to those industry safety standards, given that would put us um, in a higher tier of culpability, we'd want to be making sure that um, we've actually incorporated that in our um, hazard controls. And um, monitoring employee health, as someone's um, already brought up, to ensure that their work is not having an adverse effect on their health and well-being. Um, Melissa, I was just wondering, do the employee, does the employee have a choice of whether they can um, have, be monitored or not? So um, they have a choice of whether So generally with a policy, and a health and safety policy, um, the employer um, would be able to alter a policy, but there would need to be reference in the employment agreement to that monitoring of health when they, um, um, when they are employed in the first instance. But then in saying that with um, employment agreements, just like Janet said, um, if you're using a generic um, off-the-shelf type employment agreement, there may not be provisions for some of those types of testing. Great. Okay. So this is an example of um, what we recommend um, for a hazard register. Um, so one of the key issues when doing the health and safety plan for my own farm um, with my husband was that what I considered to be a significant hazard, he had different views on. Um, so making sure that there's a, you know, a guide for employees to be able to assess the significance um, of the hazard. So you'll see up the top there on the left, what's the likelihood of that hazard um, you know, causing harm. And then if the hazard did cause harm along the top, um, what would be the outcome? So if it's likely to cause harm, and um, the outcome would be catastrophic, then it's a critical um, hazard. So it makes the rating process um, simple um, for the employees. Um, we need to specify what the potential harm of that hazard is and then list off um, what controls that we can put in place. And Janet talked before about eliminate, isolate and minimise. Um, on a farm, it, you know, it's particularly difficult um, to do more than isolate and minimise. We can wipe up spills and eliminate them, but things like the tractor, um, we can't eliminate the tractor and still practically do our job. There is industry guidelines around things like effluent ponds, someone mentioned um, when we arrived before, but making sure effluent ponds are fenced off and that there's a minimum of two people who go into the effluent pond. So again, that's another industry guideline that's come about because that has been an issue with people falling in effluent ponds and then someone trying to save them and ending up in the pond as well. Um, you'll see there um, on the hazard controls, so that's the things that we're going to do to um, try and um, mitigate against harm of, of that hazard. And you'll see on our recommendation we've put there IG referring to an industry guideline. So um, we obviously can't um, write all of these things in the controls, but what we can do is refer to it on our master hazard register and then ensure <coughs> that our staff have um, all been made aware that there's an industry guideline um, around that specific hazard. We've also um, put a recommendation in there of listing out the hazards that require training, so TR, and you'll see there that at the bottom um, for working on hills and gullies we want people to be trained um, to understand that terrain um, that they would be working on. Any questions around um, building a hazard register? Oh. Okay, so um, accident reporting policy and procedure. So most of you will be familiar um, with this requirement and I think one of the key ones that as I said is actually understanding what serious harm is so having a clear policy of what serious harm actually is and ensuring that all accidents um, incidents and near misses are reported um, emergency management as I said uh, making sure that the actual um, evacuation plans or emergency plans are specific to the farm and specific to the likely emergencies that are going to occur um, so, you know, if you do a lot of training around tsunamis, 
um, and, and it's not very likely that the farm's going to be hit with a tsunami. That's not ideal for us making sure they know what to do in a serious harm accident, which is something that they um, are likely to encounter. Um, this is um, actually an industry um, recommendation for quad bike competency, and it's in the um, industry guideline. So we need to um, ensure that our employees are trained and supervised until they are competent. But there's some great guides that are already available for farmers for free, likes of this one, um, which helps you have a record and also ensures that the farmer knows what things he'd be wanting to check before the employees are out using the quad bikes. Um, as I said, my husband um, told me he'd been riding tractors since he was eight. He knew what he was doing, but he still learned something um, 25 30 years down the track from the training instructor. So um, this is a great tool and again it's available from WorkSafe um, free for the farmers. Managing contractors, um, so even currently now we've got a duty of care on contractors. So making sure that when we engage our contractors we supply them a list of our hazards um, and um, like the idea that was mentioned before, having a map is of particular um, use to contractors where we've highlighted no-go zones, power lines, things that they could um, come in contact with. Um, I think it's a great idea as well to have a hazard board up at the cow shed that when um, contractors arrive on the farm, um, if there's been any um, hazards created, so it might have been pouring with rain and half the lane has washed away, then we could have that written up on the board because it may not be um, in our hazard register. and We don't want to have to be um, having a lady at the gate saying um, avoid hazard on lane 3, emergency exits are lane 2. So if we have a board or something like that at the cow shed that the contractors know to, to call and um, visually see. Um, as I said about vehicle maintenance, having records of um, vehicle maintenance is very important but more important from a practical point of view, not making sure that your staff know how to carry out um, those vehicle maintenance checks um, and making sure that um, they're not doing a warrant of fitness check, it is more from a maintenance point of view that the, the vehicle or the machinery is safe to use. Um, as I said, employee engagement is something um, that we can, um, you know, a lot of farmers actually find difficult in achieving. Um, and so having a meeting template for health and safety, this is just one page of um, our two page template. The farms where we've implemented this process where we um, have suggested the topics they need to cover at their monthly meetings um, have actually found it a lot easier than um, trying to think of what to talk about for health and safety if there's um, been no accidents or incidents on farm. And obviously um, these meetings are a great opportunity um, if we see that Cam's had 11 near misses um, on the quad bike this month we might be seeing that Cam might need some further training. So you know that the, the meetings are a really good opportunity to engage the staff and um, hopefully have the opportunity to prevent um, harm being caused by, by those discussions occurring. Um, farming is obviously, um, as Janet said, um, one of the um, areas identified by WorkSafe Agriculture. Um, the reason that agriculture has been identified is for the last two years um, we've had the most fatalities um, in our workplaces, more than forestry. Um, I think that's really sad. Um, in a farming context, um, when someone is killed on a farm, it's someone's father, um, you know, it's a very, it's a brother or a dad, um, it's usually involved with a whole community. Um, it can be particularly um, hard on the people, the employers, because they've, A, they've got grief to deal with, plus they could potentially have legal issues or work safe to deal with. Um, if industry bodies like Dairy and Zed um, can help um, farmers actually a, understand their legal requirements, but help them practically um, achieve this health and safety stuff, I believe it genuinely would bring down um, that rate of fatalities that's occurring um, on farms. Um, as I said, um, Blair, my husband, had been um, riding tractors since he was eight, and our two daughters were brought up on, on the farm. One's turned out to be quite the townie, and the other one wants to grow up to be a, a farmer. Um, this is Lily, my youngest daughter, and um, this is careers day and um, in our very first cow shed when we had a, a herringbone shed and Lily brought 56 children um, out to the farm and it was absolutely entertaining and I didn't know much about Dairy and Z in those days but um, some nice person from Dairy and Z sent me down some information so the kids got to take away um, information about how cows um, make milk because most of these kids thought that you go to the shop to buy milk. <laughs> 
Um, Lily um, is not your typical um, young girl. She's obsessed with case tractors and she spent um, on average 14 hours a day with my husband developing a runoff block um, in her little training seat in the tractor. And I was hopeful she'd have a, a beautiful Barbie cake for her fifth birthday. Um, I was quite disappointed when she ordered a case MX something with jewels and some kind of trailer. <laughs> um, there's Lily. Um, the day before Lily's seventh birthday, um, Lily and Blair um, crashed down this um, 50 metre bank upside down into a river. Um, that's the, the end result of the tractor. Um, they were both wearing seat belts and were completely unharmed. Um, but that same year, um, the five fatalities that occurred in Southland, four of those could have been avoided from farmers taking that step of wearing seat belts like um, Blair and Lily. So um, obviously the legal um, point of view is really important because of prosecutions. But um, I believe that um, too many farmers are actually being killed. So if you guys can, um, as a, a body, help educate farmers on some of these um, practicable steps, um, it should make a real difference. Cool. Any questions? Just on that one with kids, like say, um, go home and I'm going to go home at Christmas and I'll be a volunteer because I don't get paid for doing any work. I go and get <laughs> A volunteer, my kids call it slavery. <laughs> yeah, so even though you're there not being paid, you are carrying out work for the business. So we do have the same duty for volunteers um, on the farm yeah. as we do for a, a paid worker. Okay, and it's, it's the same thing if, um, if I'm just cruising around the farm on the bike but not doing work? Um, so if you were um, there riding quad bikes on a farm recreationally, it would be very unlikely that there would be a work safe prosecution, but you'd have to have pretty good supporting evidence to show that it was a recreational activity. Any other questions? Oh, on that, um, you're talking about fatigue. Um, with people having employees living off farm, so five minutes down the road, um, is there any obligation for when they're driving to and from um, work? Like obviously it, four o'clock in the morning or whatever, they're getting pretty tired. Yeah, this is a, a really um, prevalent problem. Um, with farms getting bigger and less accommodation um, being available, a lot of workers are travelling to and from the dairy farm, particular issue in calving. Um, so yes, we do have a duty for our employees when they are travelling to and from our farms. So if they don't put a seatbelt on, an accident and they claim fatigue. Oh, okay, so if it was, that would definitely be a road, um, you know, like a police a police issue with a seatbelt. Um, but if it was, um, if it was, basically when there's a, what we call a road accident, even for truck drivers, um, it's decided whether it's going to be a workplace accident or whether it's going to be a police matter, um, and it can be both. Oh, just a question around insurance. Um, so yeah. public liability, is that most prevalent form of insurance that people would hold? Yeah, so there's actual specific insurance for dealing with um, these employment, and as Janet pointed out, um, for um, covering your legal fees and for the reparation. Um, and, and as Janet said before, um, we've had quite a few dealings lately with different insurance companies, um, and you know we don't have any vested interest, but I just could not believe how amazing um, FMG was when I rang up um, the day of the um, fatality with this particular farmer. Um, they had no idea who I was from a bar of soap and I said, look, this has happened to my client, um, this is what, what I need. And she rang straight back, this is what the process is, um, do you need a counsellor out to the farm? Um, we're very concerned because the level of cover is not high compared to what fines are occurring at the moment. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you definitely want to have a conversation to ensure that it's specific um, insurance for covering um, health and safety matters and for the legals and know how much you've actually got. So um, this particular policy had $20,000 for the legals um, and 100000 for the reparation and that's that would be a line probably maybe 10 years ago when policies were getting set up I'd, I'd imagine. So that wasn't, wasn't or wasn't it public liability or was it No, it's got, a, it's got a, what is it? <coughs> it's specifically statutory, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you get 
Yeah, so there is. Gets that with it. Yeah, one of the other important points around that insurance, though, is a lot of people assume they've got it, and then they get to the situation where um, they've had a serious harm or a fatality, and they don't, or they don't have enough for the illegals. And and I can tell you that the farmers that have got that cover very much appreciate when there's professionals to come in and take over managing that situation. Mm -hmm. I'm mindful of your um, of your time, three o'clock. <laughs> Um, not for both at workplace, <laughs> <laughs> but one for each of you. Thank you so much. A little um, gesture to say thank you very much. But um, I think, I don't know how the rest of you found it, but from my perspective, just a wonderful balance of personal experience and the, you know, the legislative environment and the, the environment that we're working in. It's stuff that we can both take out to farmers and apply in our own jobs. So, great balance. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate it. Thank you.